So now I, I'll stay with a pregnant woman, but we're talking about gynecological cases and I stay with my other topic one more, once, once again with endometriosis. This woman was really a challenge um, and she came to us at 20 weeks gestation with extremely strong abdominal pain. She was 43 years old and she came with the ambulance by emergency referral because of the pain. It was really sharp pain in the abdomen and she described it as um, pointing into the rectum or into the vagina. And going through her history, she said, well, there was suspicion of endometriosis, but then I got pregnant and we never really um, um, checked it or diagnosed it or ruled it out. Um, of course, um, we looked for any obstetrical um, reasons uh, for the pain and she didn't have contractions, the cervix was long, so that's what we ruled out. And then came the ultrasound. So on the left side where the black is, this is the amniotic fluid, so this is the baby and we are in the uh, left adnexa. And the first idea is, is there something or is there nothing? And when you take a look here, um, you see something that you see in at next mass. And the question is, what is this going around here? And here you have something that unilocular mass could be endometrioma looking benign, but small. Turn on the color. This is again, the black is the pregnancy We're in the left adnexa. And it's an inhomogeneous mass that we can't really, we say where does it begin and where does it end? Um, somehow looks like a hematoma, but where she wasn't bleeding outside, the baby was fine. Hmm. We asked the MRI. As I said before, not always helpful, sometimes yes. Okay, MRI said, okay, they see an endometrioma or maybe it's an ovarian vein thrombosis. Well, at this point, she was 20 weeks. We did not have too many options. We did not want to go deep into the pelvis uh, at 20 weeks. It would be very difficult with surgery. We tried to control the pain and uh, monitored the baby. And um, at the end, she had so much pain that she needed continuous um, anesthesia of the abdomen. And we couldn't control it with IV medication, but she had um, like an epidural. And two days later, they said, well, let's have another look. And this was the same finding two days later, looking completely different. And now here we have this really pulsating, um, I'll show you the video again, pulsating new structure, arterial blood flow. And uh, here we see at the lower side, we see the, we see the um, adnexal mass that looks like an, or the, the mass in the pelvis that could be suspicious of endometrioma. Show you the color flow again. And um, here, um, where there we can see can see this is an arterial blood flow also with pulse Doppler. Okay, if you're a gynecologist, this is not something you see every day. If you work in uh, internal medicine, you think of a disease that might is called aneurysm. So. We um, again asked our MRI colleagues to see if they had, if they would had an idea if this could be an aneurysm. And we have a very good interventional radiologist who said, yes, this is some pseudo aneurysm of the um, uterine artery with blood flowing out of the out of a vessel, and something that um, is very rare, but can happen in patients with an inflammation where the vessels break and we have like a pseudo aneurysm that goes into the pelvic tissue. Um, and this is something that can happen very rarely, but can happen in pregnancy. Um, 
luckily, um, our radiologist was able to um, um, uh, do an intervention and selectively embolize this branch of the uterine artery at 23 plus 3 weeks. And this is how it looked like um, after the embolization. So we don't have this pulsating mass anymore. And also we have a very happy outcome that from then on the pregnancy was uneventful and she had a cesarean section at uh, 37 weeks, so at term. So, um, and the pain of course also um, went back step by step. So um, we could also let her home um, in between 24 weeks and 37 weeks. So I know it's a, it's a rare case, but it really, um, really something we shouldn't forget. We often look at gynecologic organs and at the diseases we know from there, but uh, aneurysms can happen and they can happen in pregnancy and they are extremely painful and they can be very dangerous um, um, uh, with strong hemorrhage. So. Any comments on that, Markus? Back to tubing. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's a really exciting case. I never saw something like that. And yeah. I'm impressed how um, professionally you managed this case. Um, I think you were uh, afraid to embolize the uterine artery during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I hope the placenta was on the right side and not on the left side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It was, uh, we, were, we were not as calm as the interventional radiologist. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. was very, okay. uh, he said he knows exactly where he's going and he can fit the right, but, and the baby was fine. We monitored it during the intervention and we never had bradycardia. So yeah, but we were very nervous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great job. <laughs> now. You want to continue? I, I continue and um, I change the subject. So now we stop with um, endometriosis and we go back to um, adnexal masses. Adnexal masses um, can be very challenging, but uh, luckily now we have measures to really look at the things and diagnose them preoperatively to be quite sure about the, whether they are malignant or not and to really guide um, our surgery, the surgeons and the planning of the operation. And this again, I always present um, um, what I say about um, what I hear before I come into the room. Please look at this woman, there was a CT, there was a CT done and um, there's an ovarian cyst. So this is a 56-year-old patient with a history of breast cancer that was 10 years ago and everything was fine, but she went to her routine follow-ups and um, then she had a CT um, which revealed an ovarian cyst and um, the CA125 was also already there, was 19.8. So... So low CA125 and we look at the right mass and that's what we see on the right. We see this solid mass with perfusion and on the left side we see also another mass. Both of them the largest about three centimeters in size. So now I want to um, say you can either use your experience and say what you think what it might be um, a solid mass with perfusion um, you have you have a suspicion this might not be good but if you are not sure uh, if you are less experienced if your um, superior or more trained doctor is not available you can use the yota simple rules i will now go with you through, the, through two of the YOTA models and at the end I will also explain really short about, the, about these two YOTA models. But um, also, if you don't know the YOTA models, you will have plenty options at the conference, at the ISAC conference. So this is uh, just a glimpse and many more things also that I can't talk about in this time. Um, 
the simple rules have a malignant and benign criteria. If I use them to look at this mass, I say, is this an irregular solid tumor? I think it's not very irregular, so I thought, no, there's no ascites, there are no papillary structures, it's not a multilocular solid tumor, it's a solid tumor. But I really thought, yes, there was strong blood flow. Um, if I look at the benign features, was it unilocular? No, it's solid. Um, were the solid components less than seven millimeters? No. Were the acoustic shadows? No. Um, there was blood flow and it was not a multilocular tumor. So I had one M feature, no B feature. So it felt what, what I thought from the subjective impression. This is malignant. So the simple rules worked in this case. Um, now we have the Yota at Next model. The Yota at Next model is um, the one, a newer model, newer than the simple rules, and it has um, clinical features and ultrasound features. And this is what they asked for. And with the Yota at Next model, you can um, you get an impression on more what kind of malignant mass is this. If you think it's malignant, but you can get an impression what the chances of the histology is. So I filled out uh, the, the criteria. I'll talk a little bit later about that. And in this case, as suspected from, also from experience, but also from the simple rules, um, we have a low CA125. The highest increase in the risk so we look this we look on the on the right side is what what the population risk is and then together with the uh, with the mass risk there is an increase and then you have a pa patient specific risk so you don't, don't want to look for the highest number and the patient specific risk but you want to look where's the highest relative risk increase and that's um, the risk of metast metastatic cancer to the adnexa of course we knew she had a history but in her her uh, perception, of course, this cancer was long gone, and and of course she knew it it could come back, but this was of course not good news for her, and this was a metasta metastasis of the the breast cancer that she had ten years ago. As I said really briefly, there are many different Yota models. You need to know the you need to know how to classify the mass. If you don't know how to use the NOTA terms, you cannot use the models. If you know the terms, use one of the models, use one of the ones that helps you in your particular situation. I really think the simple rules are extremely helpful in a teaching setting. The at next model, also helpful in, an, uh, in a teaching setting, but also helpful in clinical experience to see do we need maybe additional imaging, do we need um, to think about other persons in the operation room, um, operation time, so it can really help if we have also an idea which histology we will have or if this pa patient doesn't need surgery at all. The Yota at next is a model I really like very much because we don't need Doppler. So if we are not experienced with Doppler, we can use it without Doppler. It's very practical. You can use it on your iPhone. You can download the app. It's, um, and you can also use it from the web page. And this is what I, it looks like. It asks you for, for the six ultrasound features. It asks you for the lesion diameter for the solid component and the size, so also really easy uh, predictors. It asks you, are there more than 10 locals? Also should not be so difficult to see that. Um, what is the number of populations? Are there acoustic shadows and is there ascites? So really the ultrasound criteria are very practical, especially in a big hospital with a teaching set setting. Um, for the resident to also triage and to know when do I need to call for help. Another at Nexel mass. This is a 55 year old patient with an at Nexel mass. She was asymptomatic and she had a family history. Her mother died at 55 with pelvic cancer. We don't know exactly what it was. And she had this at Nexel mass. 
So I see this lesion, I see a solid structure, I see acoustic shadows, I see like two parts right here. So this is a solid structure and here I see another solid structure looking quite different. Hmm. What is this? Always helpful to use the color to me. Seeing this one structure, not so much perfusion, but here, yes. So this is one mass right here, solid structure with shadows. And here, another one with perfusion. For me, it was not clear what is the histology. Um, also with a strong vascularization, it was quite difficult and challenging. I used the Utah simple rules. Very strong blood flow. But also acoustic shadows. Clearly acoustic shadows, not something we can discuss. They are really there. So Utah simple rules, we know 75%. We can for sure classify with the simple rules, but some are inconclusive. And here we have one M feature, strong vascularization, one B feature. So Utah simple rules said as the S expert. I also tried the Yota Adnex model. So the patient was 55. We were in a, a big center. We had um, the, uh, the, di the, it wasn't so large. It was four and a half centimeters. Uh, it had, the solid part was 28 millimeters, not, not more than 10 locules. Two populations, um, yes, acoustic shadows, yes, and a low serum CR125. So, and I was quite surprised what Yota at next told me because Yota at next said, this is a benign tumor. I wasn't sure, but they were right. We operated on the woman and this is a very uh, rare histology of a Brenner tumor, um, but it was a benign tumor. So this woman also, um, also uh, of course was very happy. But um, we were with the history, given the history, which you always have to keep in mind when you do the exam, uh, not knowing what kind of cancer the mother died of. Um, and then we had this mass with the high vascularization. But um, of course, the acoustic shadows are always a very strong hint for a benign finding because uh, they look looks a little bit like fibroma. So it was, a, to me, it was a difficult case but in the end, it was a benign tumor and the Yota at next model also predicted that. So it works. You know that I'm really a fan of um, the Yota criteria and um, thanks for advertise for these uh, criteria. And um, I want to announce that we also make Yota courses in tubing and um, you, Gwendolyn, are part of this and yeah. uh, always happy to give you a welcome in tubing. And um, if some of, um, of the audience um, is interested, um, in November will be the next course. But we don't know if it will be online or present um, present um, uh, course. So we come to the next case. Um, and it's a very, very actual case. And it shows the problems we just have nowadays. It's a 73-year-old woman, a nice woman, and she has, um, since six months, strong postmenopausal bleedings. And what has she done? She has done nothing because she avoided to go to a gynecologist or in the hospital due to fear of COVID-19. And this shows what the problem of nowadays is. We have a big um, hidden co-mortality and co-morbidity of COVID-19 due to these histories. And this is not a rare case. And now the bleedings became stronger. And now she presented in the um, ultrasound department for further diagnosis. And this is what we already expected to see. Yeah? What you see is this uterus and it's filled filled with a cystic um, solid cystic mass but uh, you see this macrocyst about two centimeters and the complete mass is about eight to nine centimeters so the uterus for this 
uh, old women is uh, quite enlarged. And if we go in details and we um, make a Doppler ultrasound, you see this pattern of vascularization. So it's an increased um, vascularization color score four. You see um, high velocities with a low um, resistance. And this is very easy to say that this is more than suspicion for endometrial cancer. And we made firstly a hysteroscopy and curettage, and this confirms that it's a hybrid serious endometrial cancer, at least FIGO 1B or 2 stage. Why 2? Because I go back in my slides. The MRI said they think it's stage 1B, which means um, that the um, tumor um, um, invaded more than half of the um, uterine wall. And I think this is easy to see. You see how thin the rest myometrium is. So it's not a question that it's more than 1B stage. But you also see, and this could not be described by the MI, that the tumor must go here in the cervical channel. And it's dilated the cervical channel so that you could already see the tumor mass um, by uh, inspection. So I'm sure this is um, stage two, at least uh, stage two. Um, but today was the operation. I don't have uh, the result. She gets a hysterectomy, uh, adnexectomy on both sides, and omentectomy. But you see, what is the problem um, of nowadays? These late, um, um, unnecessarily late um, diagnosis of endometrial cancer. And in endometrial cancer, it's a pity, yeah, because um, the uh, impact of ultrasound is underestimated, especially in the German guidelines. Mm -hmm. Here you have, you see one very well um, trial which shows what are the criteria for endometrial cancer. You see the endometrial thickness um, more than four millimeters. And this typical Doppler sign, like we saw it in the first case, with this typically packed vessel. So you have the, the impression that there is one, um, one single origin of um, some vessels, and they always are packed for um, several vessels are packed in, in one point. And um, the uh, solid mass has an irregular surface, which can be easily seen if you have some liquid in the uterus. Um, here, for you can use uh, contrast if you want. And if you have a look uh, on the endometrial junction zone, you see that it's interrupted. So this is the invasive zone of um, the endometrial cancer. Um, you also have a look at the BMI. It's known that the BMI has a high um, impact um, on the risk for endometrial cancer. And this you can use in, in your diagnostic uh, risk calculation. And if you put all this together in a calculation, you can get a sensitivity of 91% and a specificity of 94% in this trial. And I think this shows that this is a good pre-operative diagnostic tool, which is unfortunately underestimated. And um, like we have the IOTA criteria, there are also IETA criteria. And I can really recommend to read this because um, one benefit of the IOTA criteria is that we now have one language and we can exchange and we can make um, trials on certain um, criteria of tumors, but we all have to talk about the same um, criteria. And here in the endometrial um, cancer, we also have this uh, good um, definition of terms, and um, I can really recommend to read this. But when we remember the first case, um, it's even more important um, for preoperative management to say, OK, what stage is it? And the two criteria are, is the invasion death more than 50% of the uterine wall? And do we have a cervical invasion? Um, unfortunately, we have a large number of studies, but they are mostly very small. So the sensitivities are changing between 50 and 100%, and the specific 
the specificity is also very um, variable. But what we can say, if you look for the serious um, trials, you can say in experienced hands, there's no advantage of MRI or CT over transvaginal ultrasound. It's like in, in the um, ovarian cancer, it always depends that you have an expert um, and then it's not so important if you do an MRI or transvaginal ultrasound, you need an experienced examiner. And um, some studies see diagnos diagnostic advantages uh, by 3D. Um, and um, I think um, this will be the future in this case because it helps us to see um, the, um, the slides. And um, I think here we need more scientific work. I come to the next case. Um, a 25-year-old woman with irregular strong bleedings. And she had um, a suspicion of a uterus myoma uh, myomatosis. And she has a prospective desire for pregnancy and she was presented in our ultrasound department. And this is what we have seen. You see this mass in the uterine wall, which was um, suspected as myoma. And you see, mm, it doesn't fit to a myoma. No, it's too heterogeneous. And, and um, you see this, um, these zones. And um, we get the Doppler. And now you see, oh, this is very suspicious. Because you have really, really um, uh, high perfusion. Uh, and even if a young woman, this is really, really a color score you don't uh, would expect in a normal uterus. So we had the suspicion that this is not a myoma, that this is a sarcoma. And um, this could be confirmed. Unfortunately, it was a high-grade endometrial stroma sarcoma. Receptor negative, um, key uh, 67 was higher than 50% and P53 was also positive. We made a radical um, operation and um, we confirmed um, stage of the, um, of the sarcoma was PT1C. Mm -hmm. um, we could confirm um, in the genetic analysis a translocation, which is very frequent to find this in um, sarcomas, a translocation um, between the chromosomes 10 and 70. And we um, now do an adjuvant chemotherapy with doxorubicin and ifosfamid. So uterine sarcoma is really a challenging diagnosis, and especially because it has a so low incidence, which is the good side of uh, the sarcoma that is so, so rare. Yeah, we can expect um, 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 in 100,000. And therefore, we, we have also um, looked for the criteria, especially if you know, the preoperative detection of lyomyomas, because this is a misleading diagnosis. Lyomyoma are very frequent, sarcoma is very rare. So you have to make a good look on, on the criteria, which could lead us to a sarcoma. And the criteria are the irregular border, like we have seen it in our case. It's typical that it's an oval, solid, single mass with inhomogeneous echogenicity, which have we also seen in this case. Also um, typical is a central necrosis uh, and cystic areas, and for, um, especially this um, irregular blood flow color score three or four. And if you have um, several examinations, you have to look for rapid growth. Rapid growth means more than 20% in volume in three months. Other criteria is um, the bleeding, the postmenopausal bleeding or bleeding under um, hormone suppression. And um, normally you don't have calcifications. And what you don't have, which would be normally typical for um, lyomyoma, is this fan-shaped shadowing, like it was demonstrated by Gwendolyn for the adenomyosis. This you don't will expect in sarcoma. You will it only find very, very occasionally. So keep aware of these criteria, especially if a uh, morselation of a myoma is planned. Yeah? When you see criteria, these criteria, 
keep care. Yeah. Um, Gwendolyn, this is, uh, <laughs> yes. I know that you have that you have experience with um, sarcoma and these criteria. Could you yeah. tell us? Could, so um, you can have all the details in the poster that we have at the ISO conference. So um, <laughs> we ha we've been watching these um, uh, solid masses in the uterus for about three or four years, or even longer, five years. And we really, we try to give, um, give them, uh, prospectively give them the criteria that you just mentioned that, uh, from uh, Frederic Amand from Leuven. And it seems to work. We really, and what seems really important to me is that um, mostly we have just one mass, and this goes also through our study results. We don't have these women that come with 10, 10 little um, leiomyomas fibrils. We, they, they, we don't have um, sarcomas in these patients. We have them when they have one mass, when they have one big mass. Um, this seems very striking to me. I know it's, it can be, of course, in a, in a, in a woman with many fibrids, and, and we are especially looking for these cases and still having difficulties um, in detection, uh, because if we use these criteria, we have the problem that a lot of fibrids, they, they just grow. So the growth is a mm. difficult, challenging, yes. um, uh, challenging task. But... Um, but of course, this uh, the the case you just presented. It only just giving the first impression. It did not look like a typical fibroid. And Absolutely. if if you look at the criteria, it seems to work with a high sensitivity. And as I said, there's a poster um, by Alexandra Kniprat, and she's presenting here. Have a look at it. It's good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, do you want to close with your um, next uh, case? Yes, here I have another adnexal mass, and that's how I gave also the title. We've talked about adnexal masses before, but here I have another interesting case. This is an 86-year-old woman, and you can see on the left side, there's a multilocular solid mass. This was a woman who also had pre-existing cardiac disease, so operability was an issue. We can see here on the left the a solid part, the papillary structure, and the multiple locus. When we look on the image on the right, um, excuse me, there's a lot of color, maybe a little bit too much, but um, we see that the locules and also the mass in the solid structure have a high vascularization. So if we um, if we look at these findings, we certainly think of malignancy. And now, of course, we look at our IOTA simple rules again, and then um, we can check if we uh, to um, to check whether we still think it's malignant. If I look at the criteria, I can see that none of the M features really fits except for the very strong blood flow, because it's not a su solid tumor. There's no ascites, and it's also not very big, only three centimeters. If I look at the benign criteria, I can see that none of the benign criteria really fits. So it comes to one M feature and no B features, which means this is most likely a malignant mass. But now there's another question that arises is the question of operability. And when we look into the whole abdomen, and I really um, encourage you to do so, is we can see some more things and we can raise the suspicion of um, advanced stage disease. So in this case, we had the suspicion of carcinomatosis. We also saw another dot in the mesenterium. So we did expect advanced disease. So in this situation, we really can discuss, is this a woman who needs surgery or is this a woman who maybe needs um, chemotherapy? And going to the Yota at next model, again, also the CA125 was increased. So again, highly suspicious of malignancy. And when we put in the at next criteria, also here, we find a very high chance of advanced ovarian cancer with an increased risk of 4.9. And in fact, this was a high grade serious carcinoma of the fallopian tube. And here, especially important, look for advanced stage disease, 
to estimate operability. So these are my take-home messages. I really think at Next Analysis should be classifying according to the IOTA criteria. IOTA models are reliable tools, even in the hand of lessons, experienced examiners, and they should be used in a teaching setting, setting especially um, um, while training, and you have to really make sure that um, when you train, you learn the terms. If you don't know the terms, please visit one of the IOTA certification courses. Um, Yota at Next is a model that I think works very well because it works without CA125 and without Doppler. It works when the patient is in your room and you can have an immediate um, interpretation of your findings. And I really think we should uh, look beyond uh, what we know as the classical gynecologic organs. We should learn uh, to observe the whole abdomen um, because it can be very important for uh, the, uh, the treatment of the patient and um, in our daily clinical um, basis they are important. I think um, for now we covered the whole uh, world of gynecologic ultrasound. We looked at ectopic pregnancies, we looked at uh, adnexal masses. I hope you learned something about endometriosis and also about uterine masses. So it's really something every gynecologist will use in, in their future, no matter where they work. I really think every day we have better uh, technology. I really enjoyed your cases, Markus. Um, it just was a, a fun session for me because um, it's also, I can see, it's not only the profession, but it's also um, just the, the interest that comes um, from yourself that uh, you, you really like also what you're doing. Um, I will say bye from Basel and um, I hope to see you sometime in presence, uh, maybe, maybe in a future conference. Markus, I will see you in Tübingen, uh, likely. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> not, uh, um, I hope not only in a virtual setting and um, Yes, I say goodbye from Basel and I, I give the last word to you, Markus. So, dear audience, dear Gwendolyn, I really enjoyed our session and um, I think we did our job to show how heterogeneous gynecological ultrasound is and I hope we did some advertising for gynecological ultrasound and um, please um, participate in all the um, sessions which will be offered uh, for gynecological ultrasound in the ISO Congress and learn gynecological ultrasound to um, that the future will not be this underestimation of a very good method. Thanks and um, goodbye from Tübingen.